Hello, and welcome to Health Watch. I'm your host, Carolyn Wilson from Ledge Light Health District. The goal of this program is to bring you information on a wide range of health topics and to introduce you to the people doing great work across the community. Today, I'm joined by Stephanie Clark, Senior Health Program Coordinator at Ledge Light Health District. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the Health Improvement Collaborative of Southeastern Connecticut and the Black Health Collective. Stephanie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Great, so I've had the privilege of knowing you for several years now. Um, we've been colleagues in, in the public health field. Um, I wanna give our viewers an opportunity to get to know you a little bit more. Um, tell us a little bit about your career journey in public health. Okay, so I like to uh, tell folks that I kind of fell into public health by accident. And uh, that's when I realized kind of like my calling. So I started off at Alliance for Living, uh, which is Southeastern Connecticut's um, aid service organization, but they do far much more than that, you know, now. Uh, that's what that's what they were then. And uh, I started off as the front desk person and just, you know, being the front office person. And I got to meet some of the folks uh, and their families who are living with HIV and AIDS. And so, you know, sitting at the desk, sometimes it's busy, sometimes it's not. So I started reading some of the magazines and then looking up stuff online. Um, and I started to notice um, the disparate rates uh, by which uh, Black and African-American, however folks identify, folks uh, have HIV and AIDS. And it just, I remember thinking like, that can't be right. If we're only 12, 13% of the population, how is it that we account for more than half of HIV infections? And while I didn't have the language then, like that was my first like introduction to a health disparity. Um, and so I went from the office person at the front desk to ultimately doing outreach and development work. And um, after my time there, maybe a few months after I left Alliance for Living, I landed a job at Ledge Light Health District, uh, starting off as a, I think my title was a project assistant. And basically that meant I was the gopher for all of the health educators. And I think that it was a great way to start, right? Because it gives me um, an opportunity to learn about all the different things that are happening in the community. Um, I took notes, I picked up food, you know, I met folks. And about six months in, uh, my predecessor, Reverend Ken Harris, um, decided to go back into maternal and child health. And so that left an opening for the DPH funded grant to reduce risk factors for heart disease and stroke. And so I tossed my hat in the ring and uh, became, uh, I forget what my original title was, uh, but that was like my first time like overseeing a program. And I knew between my work at Alliance for Living and being part of the African American Health Council, which was part of that DPH funded program, that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. That's a really important history lesson. And I'm so glad you're back in the in the fold at Ledgelight. Um, I know that you're a very passionate person about all the programs that you work in. I know that you are the coordinator for the Health Improvement Collaborative of Southeastern Connecticut. Um, you talked about the, pro the former programs that may have almost led to the creation of that, um, certainly. Uh, tell us a little bit about the Health Improvement Collaborative. It's, it's, a, it's a large uh, collaborative with many different parts to it. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. So um, in 2015, I believe, uh, the Ledge Light Health District and l &M Hospital uh, began working together for the community health needs assessment. This was around the time when, uh, I think this was the first time that all nonprofit hospitals needed to uh, do their community health needs assessment. And I think at the time, Ledge Light was exploring the possibility of accreditation. So it made sense for them to work together. Um, so they uh, did a contract, I think, with Data Haven, and 
you know, decided like how that assessment was going to go. And then they reached out to community partners so we can start having a conversation about like what it looks like to, to gather the data and like what other things could we be doing. And that is around when I joined. Um, and so there was a really robust data collection effort. And um, sitting around the table, one of the first things I remember is hearing that the, the methodology was uh, a phone call. And so one of the uh, physicians that was there said, well, I have a lot of patients. He worked at an eight, uh, sorry, an FQHC. And he said, I have a lot of patients who change their number a lot, or some of them have phone where they have to buy minutes. So uh, they might not want to spend this length of time on the phone. And I, I said, I have a cell phone. I don't have a minute phone. I'm also not going to be answering a telephone number that I don't recognize. You can send me all the graphics you want. If I don't know the number, I'm not answering. Um, so we decided uh, as, as a result of that conversation to do some really intentional work around hearing the voice and of the community. So we did a lot of focus groups. Um, so what happened with that is uh, once the, you know, the prioritization and the health improvement plan were done, we talked about what it would look like to continue working together to um, to disrupt some of the you know disturbing stuff that we saw in the data and so the well, I don't think we named ourselves this quite yet but it came soon thereafter the health improvement collaborative southeastern Connecticut was born and we had a few different uh, action teams uh, not as many as we have now uh, but I think at that point there was the it was called the opioid, uh, action team, which is now the overdose action team. Uh, there was an access to care group and there was the healthy lifestyle, healthy lifestyle group. And that was the one that I belonged to. I feel like there may have been another one, but I think those are the, the three that I remember. Um, and so we decided as a collective to work together, like to put this health improvement plan into action by way of these action teams. Um, so fast forward to now, and you can feel free to ask me anything after this. We have five action teams. Um, there is the overdose action team, the Hispanic health team, the access to care team, the Black Health Collective, and the food justice action team. I feel like I, yep, that's it. That is a lot. Um, <laughs> such great work. A lot of different focuses. You know, I'm no stranger to coalition type work. Um, sometimes we see the most magic and productivity in these subcommittees or uh, teams, if you will. So um, it's really exciting that there's so much important work going on um, in all these different sectors and that it's all part of the Health Improvement Collaborative. I, I think yeah. that's great. Um, you're a busy person, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's hone in a little bit on the Black Health Collective, which I know you were co-founder of. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that, the genesis, and I think you touched on this a little bit before, um, and tell us why it's important to you. Okay. So the Healthy Lifestyles group, the data that pulled that group together, largely centered on folks who reported uh, lack of physical activity. They talked a lot about their eating habits, um, you know, uh, being overweight or obese. And largely that target population were Black folks. And uh, so I joined because I had overseen this state funded grant. So it made sense. I'm like, oh, well, I know that there are all sorts of free things that we can do to engage people in small changes they could make that that would make a difference in their overall health. And uh, I learned very early on that um, the healthy lifestyles moniker, I guess, was uh, a little too broad. And folks came thinking about ways that we these are things we could do for people to be healthy. And I was like, yes, and we should focus on this target population because this is the data that showed up. And um, there was a lot of pushback on that. 
Uh, and that was discouraging, disheartening, um, because I said, yes, it makes sense to be talking about and promoting all of these different things that are happening in the community. And because of the data that put us together, we should really be intentional about figuring out some things that we can do. And it doesn't cost a lot. Most of the stuff I did when I was here was free, free for us to do, uh, free for people to be part of. Like this stuff makes sense. One of the examples I gave, I said, I've been out of the health district for several years. And when people see me on the street, they're like, when are you going to start the walking club again? Or when are we going to do more cooking classes? And I had been, I had transitioned into philanthropy at that point. And so it was, I, I was trying to express uh, my earnest desire for us to be intentional about what we were doing. And uh, it, it seldom landed. So by the time it came time to do the 2019 health needs assessment, when the coordinating team was meeting, I said, listen, uh, I am not at all interested in spinning my wheels with this group for another two plus years. There is nothing that we can say that we did intentionally to engage people in their health and to talk about the systems like we did nothing. And, um, I'm not interested in that because I know whatever data we pull is going to say the same thing for Black folks. And I'm not doing that again. Um, and so Laurel Holmes, who was at LNM Hospital, said, Well, remember the African American Health Council while you were here? Because we were meeting in Ledge Light. I said, Yeah, absolutely. She said, Why don't we just kind of judge that and, you know, 2.0 it? And I was like, Laurel, don't play with me. <laughs> I was so excited. <laughs> And she said, no, I'm serious. And the Black Health Collective um, was born. And it is important to me because um, I'm, I'm part of the group. My family is part of the group, my friends, my neighbors. Um, and I want us to have every opportunity to be our healthiest selves. So that means that um, decisions that are made about programs that happen in the community. That means that opportunities for advocacy um, and anything else that happens should center our voices, our stories, our experience and our expertise. And um, it's been an absolute honor to be one of the folks leading this work. Um, and it is 100% a passion project. Uh, because I want all of us to be healthy. Like I want everyone to be healthy and I 100% want us as a people to be our, our most healed and healthy selves. Stephanie, that's amazing to hear about. Um, you are 100% the right person to be leading <laughs> that collective. Um, we're gonna take a quick break. We will be right back uh, with more on the Health Improvement Collaborative right here on Health Watch. Join us. When it comes to vaping, the truth can get clouded. So let's make it clear. Vaping is not safe for kids, teens, or young adults. It's just not. Because vaping can put microscopic particles into your lungs. And dangerous things like metals and volatile organic compounds into your body. And nicotine, the same highly addictive substance found in regular cigarettes. Nicotine can harm a person's brain development through their mid-20s. Affecting learning, memory, attention, and impulse control, and priming the brain for other addictions. Vaping products also come in kid-friendly flavors that can make them appealing to youth. And many kids also use other drugs like marijuana in vaping devices. With appealing flavors, high nicotine levels, and lots of promotion on social media. Many kids think vaping is harmless, but it's not. So talk to your kids about the risks of vaping, because when you talk, they hear you. Welcome back to Health Watch. Uh, so thrilled to be here with Stephanie Clark of Ledge Light Health District. Um, before the break, we were talking about the Health Improvement Collaborative, and you 
uh, talked about the Black Health Collective a little bit, and uh, I wanted to start uh, again talking about one of the events that, that happened recently that was very well received, um, beautiful trauma, storytelling, and how it can bring awareness. Uh, we worked with a community partner. Uh, tell us a little bit about that event at the Guard and how that was sort of groundbreaking and, and what it means for the future. So that's a great question. So one of the uh, priorities for the Black Health Collective is around mental health, right? Specifically destigmatizing what it looks like to uh, live with mental health issues, what it destigmatizing what it looks like to get into treatment and get care. Um, so we'd done a video series with uh, one of our partners, Frank Colmenares, the uh, principal at Really Media. And uh, I had asked three people to answer some questions about the state of mental health in our, our uh, for Black folks in our area. And there was uh, one other person that joined the conversation and he was closer in age to Frank and they knew each other, uh, but they had like this really, um, I would say inspiring conversation. So Frank is also a music artist and he was working on a project that based on this conversation with Jason Pelham, he ended up actually putting his project on the side and he wrote a six track album called Beautiful Trauma where he, uh, for the first time, he says, dug into some of the, um, things that had happened in his life. And, uh, you know, he talks about uh, witnessing his mother um, uh, being abused by his stepfather uh, and some other things that happened. And so when he talked to us about this album and then I gave it a listen and the first time I listened to it, I was just like, oh my God. And we talked about the importance of black men in particular. Um, you know, dealing with having these things that they've never talked about. So one of his things was like, he never talked about this stuff openly. And so what it would look like to create an experience where he is able to perform these tracks and like make it okay to talk about living with mental, you know, like having these traumas. And then um, we got to talking about what it would also look like to maybe get him into a therapy situation. And so we came up with this idea of him doing this live performance of his album and in between some of the tracks, having a therapy session in real time in front of the audience. And um, it was just wonderful like I it's very brave of him first of all like super courageous to be that open and vulnerable um in general like just to go into getting treatment and to do it the way he did it like he did his first therapy session in front of like a hundred people um and it was like there were at, at several points there were no dry eyes in the house um and I just admire him so much for being in that space and being willing to say, it's okay to say you're not okay. And it is okay to either talk to your friends or a therapist um, about whatever is you know, troubling you. And let's make it okay for people to not be okay and let's be very present for them. Like, so I, I believe that a large part of that message was you know, sometimes when we see people having issues or melting down, it's easy, especially with the social media and things like that, you know, it's easy to kind of poke fun. And he's like, yeah, that's not cool. Let's let's make it so that that is not cool. Let's make it cool to talk, uh, talk amongst ourselves about these things. Um, and I just couldn't be happier about the way it turned out, the conversations that it has continued to uh, produce. Um, and we're still moving forward with uh, trying to get some more performances. I think he's done like three or four other uh, similar performances since then. 
And it's just been wonderful and groundbreaking. And that's the, the thing, right? Like we're gonna talk about it. Uh, for too long, it's been this taboo thing in our community. And that keeps us in bondage to these traumas. And for us to be fully whole and healed, we gotta talk about it. And we have to do the work to work through it and you know get on the other side of it. Absolutely, and you know that was such a creative way to highlight the importance of storytelling, uh, shed light on mental health and the importance of doing what you need to do to take care of yourself. And uh, yeah. I think um, I think you're right. You used the word groundbreaking, and I absolutely think um, I just remembered it was. something else. I apologize. Sure. Yeah. So uh, when we were going into it, I also wanted to make sure that. Uh, in case something that was shared was triggering for folks who are in attendance, that we had people on standby to uh, help folks with that, right? So I had one, two, three uh, clinicians mm. who were uh, on standby and I had them, you know, like raise their hands so people could, you know, go to them if something, you know, raise something for them and you needed to step out. So I said, you know, if you need to step out, that's fine. We can find these people if you need to talk to someone in real time. And I also had someone who was like a breathing specialist that can help you sort of like recenter. So we had those uh, folks in place because we didn't want anyone to become triggered, be feeling something and then leave feeling that they may be harmed or like exposed or vulnerable uh, we wanted to make sure folks left feeling that they had the support they needed. That is fabulous. And again, looking forward to other projects that can come up and, and great events like that. Another event I wanted to touch on just quickly, um, there was a, you guys kicked the year off with an advocacy event, encouraging people uh, to get more engaged in the community and um, to, to really speak out about the things that they were passionate about. Um, is there more of that to come? How did you think that event went? Um, we'll be seeing more of that. So that was a multi, uh, there were three collaboratives that were actually part of pulling that together. The Eastern Connecticut Health Collaborative, uh, which is kind of like the Northern uh, tier version of what we do at the HIC. Um, and then the, East, the uh, New London Human Services Network, and the HIC. So all three of our networks came together and we invited members of the these three networks to come together to do an advocacy training. The first part was like an advocacy 101. Uh, and uh, so folks who were new to the space got to learn some stuff and folks who were, you know, veterans in the field, they 100%, you know, had a, a great rush up course. And then the second half was looking at the ways that we could work together um, to advance uh, legislated, legislation um, that would enhance opportunity for folks to thrive throughout Eastern Connecticut. Um, so while we didn't come to any decisions on the actual issues, because I feel like each one of the collaboratives has their own issues, and these issues are all also very connected, right? As it, as it relates to health and opportunities for folks and families to thrive. Uh, so what we ended up with was folks who maybe knew of each other's agencies, but had not met, worked together. And so now we have folks from all three agencies who are like, when something comes down the pike, let us know about it. We'll do what we can to sign on in support of or in opposition to whatever is coming down. Um, and so each individual organization in each collaborate collaborative um, has their own issues and then the collaboratives have their own and we're also working together in one solid coalition so I think that our legislators uh, may be hearing a lot more from us as constituents as voters as people who are in the service you know taking care of the communities of their constituents and uh, I think after the session we'll talk about what worked what didn't work and how we can work together more closely uh, as we prepare for the next session. That's amazing. And I think, you know, between the, the two different events we talked about, uh, 
it's important to speak up when there are things that you care about and um, there are people who are listening. So I think that's a good take home message for that. Um, just to wrap up today, um, I, I, there's no doubt in my mind and you've shared this, um, you're so passionate about the work that you're doing. Uh, how can people um, find out more about the work that you're doing or maybe get involved? So uh, I, if you have any questions or want more information, feel free to email me. My email address is S like Sam Clark, C-L-A-R-K-E at LLHD.org. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, if you want to get on the HIC listserv, happy to do that. Or any of the action teams, happy to guide you to the right person. Or if you just want me to tell you more wonderful stories about myself and my work, happy to do that as well. Awesome. Stephanie, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I hope we can do this again in the future. There's no shortage of things that we can talk about. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And to all of our viewers today, thank you so much for tuning in. We hope that you will join us again right here on Health Watch. <laughs>